I understand that a lot of you won't have read it. Um, I'm going to read a couple of extracts so you can get a flavour. And maybe if you're wavering about whether to buy it or not, that might tip you over the edge. <laughs> um, and I'm also going to talk about some of the stories in the book and why um, I wanted to write it. Um, so, um, as the cover may suggest, I am a geek. And I come from a family of Indian geeks. My dad, I'm, I studied engineering at university. My dad was a chemical engineer. And I have lots of engineers and scientists in my family. Um, and so maybe it was inevitable that I'd, I'd always write this thing. Um, but actually, you know, of all the trips I made to India when I was growing up, it never felt a very scientific place to me. It always felt um, there wasn't that much original, exciting research going on and not that many great technologies coming out of the country. Um, and then, um, about two years ago, um, Wired magazine asked me to do an article about lie detectors being used in Indian courts, a new type of technology invented in India being used in Indian courts. And so I traveled to Mumbai to do this story. And when I was there, I was astounded. It felt like a sea change had, change had happened in Indian science and suddenly, there was n not just wacky technologies like lie detectors, which is a wacky technology, but also really interesting stuff and really original science going on. And um, I thought this has to be chronicled. India, despite the subtitle, which is the product of my marketing department at my publishers, Indian science is not taking over the world yet, <laughs> but um, I think it will, and I think it's on the way to getting there. And so this is about that revolution, that scientific revolution that's happening now. Um, and this isn't your typical book about India. There's no elephants in here, or at least I don't think so. <laughs> no slums, no holy men. Or, well, there's some geeky holy men, but there are <laughs> none of your traditional holy men. Um, it's about a side of India that you don't generally get to see, but is becoming more important by the day. And it's a side that I see when I go there, and it's a side that's relevant to me. Um, now, the weird thing about India is it is this country of paradoxes. Everyone finds it very strange. So this is the 11th largest economy in the world. It has a GDP now of around 8%. Um, and yet it doesn't seem like a superpower on the surface. If you travel there, if you've ever been there, it, it seems like a very much a developing country and not even at the top of a developing country, near the bottom of a developing country. So how do you square that? with this idea that India is also a nation of geeks. And um, so I just want to start by reading um, an extract near the beginning. This is um, chapter one, um, just a few paragraphs down. Um, and it's a, it's a section about chess. And chess is a very popular game in India. Indians love chess. The country is ranked fourth globally in the sport. And chess players insist it is a sport, and in fact they are trying to get it uh, admitted into the Olympic Games as a sport, <laughs> above the United States, which is ninth. But there's something more unusual about this love of chess. Generally, India is not a sporting nation. In fact, apart from cricket and a handful of other games, chess is a rare exception in a land that has one of the worst sporting records of anywhere in the world. Take the Olympics, for example. In the history of the modern games, the United States has won 2,549 medals. Great Britain has won 737, and China 429. Even the small Eastern European nation of Belarus has taken home 73. But you have to scroll almost to the bottom of the league tables to find India. It sits just above the desolate Central Asian Republic of Mongolia and just below Slovakia. In the whole of the Olympics history, India has won only 20 medals. Given the country's vast population, it's a mystery that's confused sports writers for decades. So a few years ago, two US researchers, Anirudh Krishna from the Sangford Institute of Public Policy at Duke University and Eric Hagland from the Congressional Hunger Center decided to investigate. A country of more than a billion people, like India, they calculated, should have won 157 medals at the 2004 Olympic Games. But of course, this fails to take into account that elite, elite sports are expensive, ruling out millions of Indians who would never have a hope 
of becoming professional athletes. Wealth and size aren't the only things that determine Olympic success either. There's also the general level of education, people's health, and how close they live to sporting facilities. So the researchers crunched the numbers again. Taking into account the myriad factors that determine sporting success, they came up with a far more conservative estimate. India should have won around 14 medals at the 2004 Olympic Games, they said. In reality though, the country won just one. In fact, no other nation in their study had such a huge gap between its predicted medal count and the actual total. Now this chapter is set um, at a chess tournament, so it's one of the first places I went to in India. I'm at this chess tournament um, and, I, and I was speaking to a sports journalist who was there. He said to me, India does not, did not and does not have a sporting culture. The veteran Indian sports columnist Rohit Bridgenath explains to me frankly. Today Bridgenath works for the Straits Times newspaper in Singapore after the Indian sports magazine he was writing for closed down. Mm -hmm. Personally, one of the things that I always felt as a sports writer was a lack of drive among many athletes. I can't understand it. It, was much bet it is much better now, but earlier you only found that drive here and there. In exceptions, like the great 400 meter runner of the 1960s, Milka Singh, who used to boast that he trained so hard that he used to pee, pee blood. My theory, and it's just mine, he adds, is that we're better suited to hand-eye sports like shooting or billiards or archery or thinking sports like chess. The cash prize open chess tournament, where I am, is about to begin in the school hall. Players get ready to enjoy the game, someone announces, and the room transforms into a hive of shuffling pieces and clicking clocks. Every player is dreaming of glory, that they might one day earn the title of chess grandmaster shared by 21 other Indians, including the current world chess champion. I turn to Radhi Sham Tuari, a 64-year-old international arbiter for the World Chess Association, for his opinion. He has been playing this game for 40 years. Watching the players on the table next to us, he ponders the question for a while. Indians, well, basically they have a good liking for brainy games, he announces at last, rolling each R with his tongue. Yes, and we are good at brainy things, he continues. Brain makes us supreme. And that is the culture of India, this idea that the brain makes us supreme, that this is not a country of athleticism, but is a country that is supreme when it comes to thinking sports. So if you look at, um, y you know, they do really bad in the, in the Olympic Games, but in the Olympiads, which is an academic contest that happens every year, India comes, in, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> they bring back loads of gold medals. Um, and this culture, one of the things I was trying to figure out when I was writing the book is, how far back does this culture go? Um, and India's love of science, if, although, you know, 2,000 years ago they didn't call it science, actually goes back quite a long way. Um, the zero was invented in India. So Indian mathematicians, um, it might sound like a small thing now, but the zero is a linchpin of modern mathematics. Without it, we wouldn't have negative numbers. We wouldn't have m much of modern mathematics. That was invented in India. And 1,500 years ago, 2,000 years ago, India was a center with China of philosophy and mathematics. Um, and weirdly, as an aside, when I was traveling around India, I got really caught up in this ancient history, although not much of it is in the book, but a bit. Um, and I wanted to track down the oldest scientific document that I could find in India. And um, it was only near the end of my journey that I found it. And it was actually in the library at Oxford University where I studied. So I had to go back to the UK to see it. And very kindly, they let me see it. This old piece of palm leaf manuscript, faded. You can see plus and minus signs on it. And it's at least 1,000 years old, possibly 1,500. Which just goes to show, before the West had even encountered these ideas, they already existed in Asia. Now, of course, that didn't help because now we're in the situation that we're in. The, w the East declined and the West rose. Um, and there are lots of reasons for that. And I, I don't know the reasons myself. I know, pos you know possibilities, but I don't think historians have ever put their finger on it. Um, but then why are we seeing the rise that we're seeing now? That's the next question. India is doing 
phenomenally well in IT and software? And what are the roots of that growth, given that there's already a culture and a love of science in, in the society? And for that, um, we need to look just 60 years back. So in 1947, India gained independence from the British. And Jawaharlal Nehru became India's first prime minister. And you may not know this, because we generally know Nehru as this really charismatic ladies' man who was this great leader of a nation. Um, but he was a geek, actually. And it, he studied natural sciences at Cambridge University. And when he became prime minister, one of the first things that he did was to um, start this council for scientific and industrial research in India and make himself the president of it. And then um, also start a, a huge legion of colleges known as the Indian Institutes of Technology, which today are powerhouses. They've produced some of the um, leading politicians and technocrats leading India. Um, if you go to Silicon Valley, you'll meet lots of IIT graduates. The founder of Sun Microsystems is an IIT graduate. Um, so, and, th and this all stemmed from 60 years ago. So when Nehru was first prime minister, he's, he kind of instilled this love. And you can see it now. If you, um, if you look at the Indian constitution, and this is unique, this doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. If you look at the Indian constitution, it has a list of fundamental duties for all Indian citizens. And one of them is to develop the scientific temper, humanism, and the spirit of inquiry and reform. So inside the Indian constitution, given that this is one of the most religious countries on earth, the birthplace of four major world religions, and you know the, the home of spirituality, this Nehru and subsequent leaders were telling Indian people, even if you're not scientists, we want you to be more scientific and more logical and rational in your everyday lives. We want you to carry that spirit of science with you. And that's a baton that has been carried by the society and by subsequent leaders, every subsequent leader, for 60 years. So today, when we look at the IT industry and we ask ourselves, how did this happen so suddenly? How did India suddenly become such a great, powerful nation in software? Actually, those roots lie much further back. And for me, that legacy is continuing. So in the book, what I explore is um, not just what's happening now, but this emerging revolution of kids that have grown up with parents and grandparents carrying Nehru's legacy forward. Mm -hmm.